really been uh, amazing to live through this period when I uh, went to the Olympic Games, uh, achieved great success, won a gold medal, and uh, returned back home, back to uh, Oregon State University where I was attending school. And, and people were, were asking me, do you understand that you're going down in history? Uh, I didn't really understand the context. Uh, I, I just couldn't see it at the time because I was still focused on living in the moment. And uh, so for me, I had a technique that I had developed. It had taken me several years to really begin to refine and, and perfect. And, and getting to the elite level, winning a gold medal at the Olympic Games, proved that it succeeded. It worked for me. I just simply had no idea that others would be able to use the technique. Uh, I thought that there might be a few that could have success, but as time went on and uh, every Olympic champion used this technique from, from then on, uh, and, and eventually, today, every high jumper uses the same style. It just proves for me that this was going to happen. The technique was, uh, was in development. I was the first one that achieved success, so, uh, so I got to name it. And uh, I, I'm very honored that I was able to contribute to a sport that that I love and I, I'm happy that others have found success with uh, using this technique. What I did was uh, I started with an old style called the scissor style and, and this was a, a technique that was used in the first Olympic Games in the high jump. Uh, the, the classic style in the 60s, uh, most everyone was using what was called the straddle or the western roll where the jumper would go over on their belly facing the bar and roll over the bar, land in the pit. I had learned the scissor style as a young boy when I first started track and field, and that was a style that was natural to me. It was easy, simple mechanics, uh, and, and that's what I used. When I got into high school, my coach informed me that this technique would be limiting and that I would never reach my potential. So he insisted that I change. I, I went back to try to learn the, the straddle technique and had very poor results, uh, became very frustrated. And, and as a young man, I, uh, I wanted to go back to what I started with. So I, I went back to the scissors and in this next meet, uh, I cleared my personal best which wasn't very high, five foot four, about one meter 65. And uh, going for a new personal record, I knew I had to do something different. So I, I felt like I needed to lift my hips up to get over the bar and, and move my shoulders back to, to get out of the way. And it, it worked, I, I made it. Raised the bar again, I did it a little bit more, and. Each height, I continued to feel how I would uh, go over the bar, and, and that day I improved half a foot, 15 centimeters, and, and went from sitting on the bar to laying flat on my back, and that was really the revolution. Uh, the next two years, running at the bar with the curved approach, I started to lead with my shoulder, that caused me to go over at a slight angle to the bar. And eventually, two years later, I was completely rotating with my shoulders and turning back to the bar and arching over the bar. That's how I developed the Fosbury flop. What happens is, is when you're performing as an athlete, it's not like you have a, a direct communication with the sports fans. They're sitting in the bleachers. What happened though was I, I could hear the reaction that uh, the oohs and ahs and uh, even cheering, screaming once they first started to see how I was jumping, 
So I, I knew that I was getting a reaction. Now, to, for, a young, uh, for a young athlete, that's what we all crave, is a little bit of attention. So we like to be noticed, but we don't want to really be so different that we're, we're uh, 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 completely unusual or a monster. So there's always this conflict of, of how you receive your attention. Mine was always a positive reinforcement. People were happy, they were cheering, uh, a lot of laughing. And so I think that was, uh, that was a positive response from my perspective. The coaches uh, were more interested in whether I was following the rules, especially the opponent, opposing coaches. Uh, but it, it was all legal by the rule book. So the other high jumpers more or less really left me alone. They didn't ask me about it all that much. Uh, they, they knew it was different. but. Because I was still developing, they were not motivated to change and give up the technique that they had practiced for hundreds and hundreds of hours. So I was really left alone to, to do this and, uh, until I introduced it on the global stage at the Olympic Games. And when I won, that that convinced every kid that saw me jumping, that looks like fun. The guy won, I want to try it. And they, it was the young people that really created the revolution and they transformed the event. It's clearly a different look and, and you know what, what's interesting is that as I was transforming my style, going from the scissors to a back layout to rotating my back to the bar, all of that was going through a process that, that really was not pretty. And so, you, I mean, I've, I've looked at old photos that my father took, and, and you could see my arms were going one direction, legs another. I was really... You could see that I was trying, I was searching, but it was a process. So it, it's just interesting that people don't notice the, the struggle to get there, the work that it takes, uh, the failures that you survive, uh, never giving up, and, and eventually finding a form that is refined and is graceful. And uh, it, it was really at the Olympic Games uh, on the field that it really began to become clear. Th this is a technique that is smooth, it's graceful, it, it, looks, uh, uh, it looks refined, it looks easy. And I think that was a positive motivation for other high jumpers to try this technique, is that it, it did look simple, it looked easy to try. You're right, there's clearly a difference between that and the struggle of trying to roll over the barge, uh, the classic uh, athletic uh, technique. Uh, mine was a little bit, uh, perhaps more graceful and, and uh, attractive in that sense. When I was a, a young athlete, we were all jumping into sawdust, into wood chips uh, around the world. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, the athletes had landed in sand. And uh, they, they would elevate it a little bit, but obviously the jumpers were very focused on their landing. Uh, at least as much as getting over the bar. But it, with the, the wood chips, it was a softer landing area, so it, it really worked for the high jump and the pole vault and enabled us to jump higher and be less concerned about how we land as long as we had that fluffed up and, and a nice soft landing area. Our high school in 1964 was one of the first in the state of Oregon to have foam. 
1964 in the Tokyo Olympics was the first time they had a foam landing area for the high jump. So the environment was changing and it was for the better because uh, even foam uh, and as they began to elevate it above the ground, it was much safer for the high jumper. And clearly I no longer had to be concerned with how I was going to land. I could focus absolutely on getting over the bar. So the technology and the environment really helped us.